Howdy folks, how are you doing? Hope you've all had a good weekend, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. I've got a new pair of glasses this week. It's been about two years since I had my eyes tested. Uh, let's just say my prescription was badly in need of getting updated. Uh, the new glasses that I'm wearing, it's just, it's like... I can see! <laughs> I didn't realise how badly uh, my glasses needed changing. Uh, does this mean that you're going to stop misidentifying ships and tanks, Jingles? Uh, steady on, let's not get too carried away. Um, but while I was in town, picking up my new glasses, I saw the most bizarre thing. Um, there was a busker, a, a street musician. Um, well, I say musician, he was really just a singer. Well, I say he was a singer. <laughs> he wasn't playing any instruments or anything, he was quite an old fella. Um, he just sort of had this karaoke machine set up and he was sitting in the middle of the high street um, singing along. Well, I say singing along, he didn't know the words <laughs> to most of the things that he was singing. Uh, and when he did know the words, it was mostly just the choruses. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> he's uh, belting, his voice wasn't great either. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So you've got this old fellow who may or may not have been drunk or possibly doing it for a bet, standing in the middle of the high street, belting out these Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin tunes, although mostly just the choruses, and even then sometime he'd lose track halfway through and just hum <laughs> until he got to the next bit that he knew the words for. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, nobody really knew where to look. <laughs> It's like, is there going to be somebody along to take care of him in a minute or two? <laughs> it was like, I, I got the impression that somebody had gone shopping with their granddad, um, who's, you know, his beans weren't all in the jar, um, and they just left him in the high street while they popped into the chemist or something and said, <laughs> now you'll be all right by yourself for a few minutes, won't you, Grandpa? Yeah, yeah, sure, fine. And then the second <laughs> his daughter disappeared, or whoever was supposed to be looking after him, he just suddenly started belting out these show tunes in the middle of the street. It's kind of what it was like. It was just this really, really weird experience. It was not unlike watching the song and dance routine on the World of Warships stage at Gamescom. Was anybody there who actually saw it? Because I, I only watched it on the live stream. I'm pretty sure that if you saw it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> And if you haven't, I urge you, I urge you to go and try to find a, a VOD of it. Because I guarantee it will be the most uncomfortable ten minutes you've ever spent on the internet. And that includes the time you were watching Girls and Panzer. Your dad came in and you had to try to explain what it was that you were doing. <laughs> oh, God. So anyway the benefit of people who haven't actually seen it yet. Um, <laughs> um, right before the submarine announcement slash unveil happened on the World of Warships stage at Gamescom, um, for some bizarre reason they decided that it would be a good idea to introduce the submarines via the medium of dance and experimental jazz impressionism. <laughs> It's the only way I can describe it. Either that, or the guy was booked to do a five minute song and dance routine right before the submarine unveil, and they just pushed him out onto stage ten minutes early and told him, just improvise, make something up. <laughs> I, I can't recommend enough that you see it. In fact, I've put a link down below in the video description. In fact, stop what you're doing right now. Stop watching this video. Come back and watch the rest of this video later. Click the link in the video description and prepare for the most awkward 15 minutes <laughs> you've ever experienced on the internet. In particular, pay attention to the faces of the people in the audience. <laughs> the poor suckers who were actually there trying to figure out what the hell was going on. It was... <laughs> when it started, I rushed through into the other room. I said, Rita, you've got to see this. What? What? World of Warships, Gamescom, live streams, like, oh, do I have to? No, no, trust me. If you don't see this, you're going to kick yourself. You're missing internet history unfolding live on screen as we speak. Just don't argue, shut up, 
go to YouTube, Twitch, whatever, just watch the World of Warships live stream. I came back uh, into my room and all I could hear was screams of laughter <laughs> coming from Rita's end of the house. Even the stream chat, which normally has a smart answer for everything, for once was utterly baffled. <laughs> just had no idea what to make of what they were watching and listening to. So that, for me, was the highlight of Gamescom. <laughs> but anyway, yes, submarines in World of Warships. Uh, right, where to start? Well, I suppose the first thing that we have to get out of the way is that absolutely everything that you saw, or if you weren't watching and you haven't seen any videos on the subject, everything that you didn't see um, is subject to change. So everybody who's losing their minds over the whole issue of submarine gameplay, um, as usual, completely overreacting. Nevertheless, having said that, and bearing in mind myself that all things are subject to change, there were certain things that I thought were really cool, and certain things that I really didn't like too much at all um, about the sneak preview that we had of submarine gameplay at Gamescom. So, to summarise the strengths and weaknesses of submarines for you. First, concealment. When a submarine is on the surface, it will have its full concealment value. So, for example, if it has a surface detection range of 5 kilometres, and in general, because they are much, much smaller targets, even when they're on the surface, submarines are probably going to be more stealthy than destroyers, but let's say 5 kilometres. When it's on the surface, it will be detected at a range of 5 kilometres. And it will be detectable by radar as well. When it's at periscope depth, its concealment is buffed by 50%, so its detection range goes down to 2.5 kilometers, or half of whatever it was when it was on the surface. When it submerges, it becomes completely invisible. It can't be detected by surface ships at all. It can be detected by other submarines only at proximity detection range, 2 kilometers, and it can only detect other surface ships at proximity detection range, two kilometers. Next, submarines attacking. Submarines fire their torpedoes at periscope depth, and they can fire the torpedoes along a target indicator track based on the target that they're locked on in exactly the same way as everybody else who fires torpedoes. But submarines also have one other ace up their sleeve, acoustic homing torpedoes. Now, if you look at the picture of the ship in the graphic there on the screen, you'll see that each ship has two Let's call them sonar contact points, or target points. One in the bow and one in the stern. After you've fired a torpedo at a target, you can increase the chances that the torpedo is going to hit that target if the target should suddenly vary its course and speed by emitting an acoustic pulse, which travels relatively slowly through the water and attempting to hit one of those two sonar target points, if you like, on the enemy ship with your sonar pulse. Now this is a lot harder to do the further away the ship is because of the length of time it takes the sonar pulse to move through the water. But if you do manage to make contact with one of those targets, if you like, on the enemy ship with your sonar pulse, then any torpedoes that you've launched that are in the water will start to home on that point. Now, before everybody gets carried away, these are not Mark 48 ADCAP torpedoes. These are not Tigerfish. Right, they're not pulling any kind of radical manoeuvres here. They're not going to suddenly double back um, and hit you even after you've dodged them. They turn slightly to head in the direction of whatever was pinged. So that's great for the submarine. Well, it is and it isn't. Because while getting a sonar lock, if you like, on your target will increase the chances that one or more of your torpedoes are actually going to hit the target, even if it does adjust its course and speed, it also gives away your position on the minimap. And that is where the anti-submarine warfare side of the game comes in. Now, at the moment, the only ships in the game that are armed with depth charges and can conduct attacks on submarines while they are submerged are destroyers. Although, once again, this is subject to change uh, based on how initial testing turns out. And when a destroyer is going after a submarine, you start playing a little sort of anti-submarine warfare minigame, and it kind of works like this. If you're in a destroyer and a submerged enemy submarine has been detected, you will see a circle on the surface of the ocean and on the minimap 
indicating the last known position of that enemy submarine. Now that circle isn't going to stay there forever. If you can get into that circle in time, and it might not always be safe to do so, depending on what the other members of the enemy team are doing, but if you can get into that circle in time, it will update with the new nearest position of that enemy submarine. The submarine's going to be frantically trying to get away from you, and if you can chase him down by chasing these circles around, and you shouldn't have to do more than two or three, once you're above that submarine, your destroyer will automatically dump depth charges on him, and they will do a huge amount of damage to a submarine. So, to summarise, submarines are going to be very, very stealthy. They're going to be completely undetectable when submerged, except two other submarines, and even then, only at proximity detection ranges. They're going to have a limited form of homing torpedoes, but activating those homing torpedoes gives their position away, and they're extremely vulnerable, even when surfaced, to enemy destroyers if they manage to get close enough. So, those are the basics. Now for the details. And if I have issues anywhere, it's in the details. Although mostly for historical reasons. I mean, I understand why they're doing things the way they are for gameplay reasons. But I'm a history nerd, and it, it kind of pisses me off when I see... Well... We'll get into the details and you'll see what I mean. First of all, let's talk about speed. You see, historically, submarines were actually very slow. The first mass-produced submarines in the world, the American Gato class, had a surface speed of 21 knots and a submerged speed of only 9 knots. The Type 5C U-boat, the workhorse of the German Navy, had a surface speed of, I think, 17... between 17 and 18 knots and could barely, at a push, manage eight knots when submerged. Well, history fans, when it comes to submarines, don't expect any kind of historical accuracy in World of Warships. I mean, the models are historically accurate, but the speeds that these things do, both on the surface and submerged, not so much. Um, and again, you know, subject to change, but for gameplay reasons, the submarines in World of Warships are only really going to be particularly slow when they're at periscope depth. When they're on the surface, we're talking speeds anything between 20 and 30 knots. And when they're fully submerged, we're talking speeds anywhere between 20 and 30 knots. And yes, this really upsets me. <laughs> but for gameplay reasons, I can understand why they're doing things the way they are. Even if I don't like it, I get it. I mean, I don't like it, but I do get it. Um, if you were limited to a submarine's actual submerged speed, you just wouldn't want to play submarines. Can you imagine what it would be like crawling along, even on the surface, at 20 knots? 20 knots is slow in World of Warships. Even on the surface, outside of detection range, at full speed, crawling along at 20 knots, falling way behind the rest of your team, and then when getting into detection range and having to drop down to periscope depth or submerge and suddenly you're only doing seven, eight or nine knots, it would be tedious in the extreme trying to get in position in order to take a shot. And when detected while submerged, if you were only doing seven, eight or nine knots and there is a destroyer coming after you that's doing 36 knots, it would just be impossible to evade destroyer depth charges. So I don't like it. But I do understand that certain liberties have to be taken with historical accuracy in order to make submarines playable in a game like World Warships. One of the other things that upsets me beyond all reasonable measure, um, and again, entirely for historical reasons, is that, well, do you remember when I said that a submarine was going to be 100% undetectable when submerged, unless another submarine was within two kilometres of it? Ah, but surely you can detect them with sonar, yeah? Hydroacoustic search? No. <laughs> but isn't that what hydroacoustic search was for? Yes, yes it was. But hydro is not going to detect submerged submarines. If they're on the surface and they're not inside visual detection range, or they're out of line of sight on the other side of an island, hydro will detect them the same way it would detect anything else may also work when they're at periscope depth. I don't know. But Hydro will not detect. As ridiculous as that sounds, you won't be able to detect a submerged submarine with sonar. So just let that one sink in for a minute. Again, I don't like it, but I do understand why they've taken this decision. 
If you stop to think about it for a minute, most ships in World of Warships have access to the hydroacoustic surge consumable. Not all, obviously, but the majority do. And once again, for gameplay reasons, it would just be impossible for submarines to get anywhere and get anything done. So again, don't like it. Flies in the face of historical accuracy, but for gameplay reasons, I can understand why they've gone with that decision. Next, oxygen, or why submarines can't stay submerged forever. Each submarine is going to start a battle on the surface with a set amount of oxygen reserves available. And as long as the submarine is on the surface, they will not be using those oxygen reserves. When they go down to periscope depth, they'll start to use up the oxygen, but kind of slowly. And when they fully submerge, they'll start to blow through their oxygen reserves at the standard rate. Now, you will be able to replenish your oxygen supplies when you're on the surface, but at the moment, it replenishes very, very slowly. Slowly enough that it's probably best to think of your ability to fully submerge and live on your oxygen supplies as a sort of get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, because once that oxygen's gone, to all intents and purposes, it's gone. It's just going to recharge so slowly as to probably not make that much of a difference. And even then, it's only really a get-out-of-jail-free card as long as you haven't been detected and there are no destroyers nearby. In fact, the developers are also talking about, although, again, they haven't made any hard and fast decisions, and it might end up being something that they test, but they are toying with the idea of not allowing submarines to recharge oxygen at all. And again, you know, not entirely historically or even physically accurate. Um, if a submarine that was running on electric batteries surfaced, all they would have to do to get fresh air throughout the boat would be to open all the hatches and fire up the diesels. Uh, the diesels would just suck fresh air clean through the boat in a matter of seconds. But again, gameplay reasons. And this may end up being something that they decide to test. Um, but either way, it's best if you think of your oxygen as a finite resource and husband it carefully and only really submerge when you absolutely have to. You've been detected, there's a destroyer nearby, there are no teammates nearby to take care of the destroyer for you, you have to submerge and attempt to shake pursuit. In those kind of circumstances, you absolutely definitely want to be submerging and using up your oxygen supplies. You probably don't want to be using up your oxygen supplies right at the start of the battle, just submerging for the hell of it to see what it looks like. <laughs> and setting off in the direction of the enemy team while submerged, just happily chewing through your oxygen supplies. Uh, it's there to be used when you need it. You don't want to need it and have already used it, because when it's gone, to all intents and purposes, it's gone. And I like that idea, because it means that a huge part of submarine gameplay, and this is historically accurate, is not just getting into position to take the shot, but it's getting out again afterwards without dying. So. I, I like the way that they're thinking of handling oxygen. And there are all kinds of different ways that you can use that to make differences between American, Japanese, German, British submarines, for example. Um, let's say German submarines start the game with a bigger oxygen supply than everybody else, and Japanese submarines uh, drain their oxygen at a slower rate than everybody else. And American submarines replenish their oxygen at a faster rate than anybody else. You get the idea. And there are all kinds of submarine-specific consumables that you can introduce, too. Um, one, for example, that I know that they're thinking about is the snorkel. I was under the impression that it was the Germans who invented the submarine snorkel, but I was wrong. They didn't. They were the first ones to actually make use of it. But the submarine snorkel was invented in 1916 by the British. And it was such a great idea that the Royal Navy decided they didn't want to use it. <laughs> <And> <laughs> fairly typical. Um, <laughs> Ten years later, in 1926, the Italians tinkered with the idea and also uh, didn't use it. But in World War II, the Germans had a bit of a stroke of luck when they conquered the Netherlands. And they also captured a pair of Dutch submarines. Yep, the Dutch. Two Dutch submarines, the O25 and O26, were captured with a device that the Dutch were calling the sniffer, and it was basically a pipe that stuck out at the top of the submarine's conning tower, uh, sucked air in while the submarine was at periscope depth, which not only allowed them to run the diesel engines, 
but also recharged the batteries. Unsurprisingly, the Germans thought this was a great idea. Not immediately, they didn't actually need to use snorkels on their submarines at the time, but by 1943 things were getting a bit more difficult for the U-boats. Uh, they were having to transit areas of the Atlantic en route to their hunting areas in the mid-Atlantic that were fairly heavily patrolled by Allied aircraft, which meant that they were forced to travel on the surface only at night, and during the day they had to travel submerged which was on battery power and was a hell of a lot slower. So this increased the length of time that it took them to get to their stations, reduced the amount of time that they could spend on station. And this, of course, was all terribly inefficient and most offensive to the German mindset. And then some bright spark said, well, what about those sniffer devices that the Dutch were using? And so from 1943 onwards, uh, most German U-boats were fitted with snorkels, which allowed them to travel at full speed or as close to it on their diesel engines at periscope depth while at the same time charging their batteries. So how would that work in World of Warships? Well, for one thing, it would allow you to presumably travel at periscope depth without expending any oxygen whatsoever. And in fact, recharging your oxygen. It might also allow you to travel at full speed at periscope depth. But there was a trade-off with the snorkel while it did all of those things, it was really noisy. And anybody listening out on hydrophones would hear you from a mile away. Well, significantly more than a mile, actually. There were other issues with the snorkels, by the way. This is all actually quite interesting. And there's a reason why I'm such a history nerd. I, I, I love reading about this sort of thing. You couldn't actually run your diesel... En you could run your diesel engines when on a snorkel, but you couldn't run them at full power. Um, the U-boats were restricted to a top speed of six knots while running the diesels on the snorkel, because if they went any faster, the snorkel tube would break off. <laughs> so there's that. And while that was a problem, it was just an embarrassing one rather than a fatal one. Um, there was a potentially fatal issue involved in running your diesel engines while sucking air in from the surface while you're at periscope depth via the snorkel. You see, the thing about a diesel engine is that it's an internal combustion engine, and to combust, you require oxygen, and that means you need a steady supply of air, and the engine doesn't really care where it gets that air from. Now, let's say you're at periscope depth, transiting to your station area in the mid-Atlantic, it's the middle of the day, you don't want to get spotted by aircraft, so you've got the snorkel up. You're cruising along at a steady six knots, but, well, you are in the Atlantic, and it's a bit choppy. And there's the potential for some of that pesky water to get into the boat via the snorkel tube. And you don't want that, because, under ideal circumstances, you generally want to keep the water outside the people compartment. So, to prevent that, they would put a simple ball cock valve inside the snorkel, in exactly the same method as you have with the kind of snorkel um, that you use when you're swimming around in the sea at the beach. The problem with this ballcock valve was that it would shut the snorkel to stop the water getting into the people compartment. But the engine's still running and it doesn't know that the air supply has been shut off and it's going to continue drawing air in and it doesn't really care where it gets that air from. And with the snorkel blocked there's an extremely limited supply of air inside that submarine and you could actually find that vacuums were being created <laughs> inside submarines that had had the snorkels blocked while the diesels were still running. It did actually happen. And the first thing the crew knew about it was the pressure difference suddenly caused all their ears to pop. And, and, and I'm, I don't just mean, you know, when you're in an aircraft, for example, and there's a slight pressure difference and, oh, my ears are a bit painful, and so you work your jaw a bit, or maybe you blow your nose and your ears pop. No, I mean, their ears would burst. <laughs> right? so, so, they would have to crash stop the diesels and then surface and open all the hatches and try to get some air in and hope that they remained conscious long enough to do all of that and hope that when they did surface there were no Allied aircraft or destroyers <laughs> around. Um, so, yeah, very, very dangerous, as I'm sure you can imagine. Now... I'm pretty sure that World of Warships isn't going to be going for quite that level of historical authenticity. But at the same time, the use of a snorkel as a consumable is definitely something that I'm sure they're probably exploring now. 
that snorkel, while it might allow a submarine at periscope depth to travel at full speed, I mean, it shouldn't. The snorkel would break if they did that, but hey, sonar doesn't detect submarines either, so <laughs> you never know. Um, they might allow a submarine with a snorkel uh, to not consume any oxygen at all while it's at periscope depth, or perhaps to even recharge its oxygen while it's at periscope depth. So I'm sure that these are all sorts of things that Wargaming are thinking about, and not just, of course, the use of possible submarine consumables, but also the whole idea of how submarines are going to impact as a fifth class in World of Warships. Also, I'm aware that the internet is losing its mind after seeing the submarine reveal at Gamescom, uh, with one camp declaring that submarines are completely overpowered, uh, and they're going to be impossible to kill, and how the hell are you supposed to fight them? And other people saying, oh my god, they're far too fragile, destroyers kill them far too easily, <laughs> and none of whom have spent a second actually playing against submarines, or playing submarines against surface ships. I'm at least looking forward to giving it a try. And I like that initially, at least, well, first there's going to be a test or a sandbox server, and then once they've gathered all the data that they can from that, they're going to unleash submarines onto the live server, but you'll only be able to play against or as submarines in a special submarine game mode, so, you know, that's good. They've definitely learned something from the carrier rework there. It's all good stuff. Uh, to address some of the issues, or the more common issues that I've seen people raising, um, particularly with regards to late game, when, you know, there aren't that many ships left alive on either team, and let's say the enemy team has a submarine and all of your destroyers have been sunk, how are you supposed to find and kill the submarine? Well, you shoot it. Well, how are we supposed to detect it? Submarines have limited oxygen supplies. At the end of the battle, it's probably not going to have any oxygen left and is not going to be able to submerge. Or if it is able to submerge, it's only going to be able to submerge for a very short period of time. So just chase after it. It's going to have to surface. And then you shoot it. And when it's on the surface, you'll be able to detect it with radar. Although I'm kind of disappointed that, for now at least, again, this is all subject to change, you won't be able to detect a submarine's periscope when it's at periscope depth with radar. Um, as early as 1940, using the British radar set model 271, we were able to pick up submarine periscopes, although at a range of only 800 metres. But as the war went on, radars got better, and it became even more dangerous for submarines. Even at periscope depth at night, we could pick them up at increased ranges. Again, you know, these are all things that are going to be subject to change. Well, what if he's not inside radar range? RPF, radar position finding, will detect a submarine when he's at periscope depth or on the surface. Submarines are not going to be able to stay hidden forever. And don't forget, when a submarine submerges, it can't see you either. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you recall watching the live stream, or for those of you who didn't watch the live stream, allow me to explain. When a submarine submerges, it can't even see what the rest of its team can see. Right? The positions of the enemy ships on the minimap stop being updated. All the submarine gets is last reported positions. So all of this is going to be tweaked and changed as a result of data gained during the testing process. If it turns out that maybe submarines are a little too powerful, one thing that they may do is include light cruisers in the anti-submarine role, give them depth charges and allow them to take part in the anti-submarine warfare minigame as well. We shall see. It's all going to come out in the testing process, and I am looking forward to giving it a damn good testing. In particular, I'm looking forward to maybe finding things that perhaps the game designers hadn't quite anticipated. I'll give you an example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. It actually happened during the live stream when Mr. Conway from World of Warships EU uh, was playing a submarine on the stream against Evan, the World of Warships executive producer. Fantastically nice guy, by the way. I've met him multiple times. He's always a pleasure to talk to. Um, and Conway did something that I'm not entirely sure the developers had anticipated. What he did was he was uh, playing around with the uh, one ping only acoustic homing thing where he would launch a couple of torpedoes at a ship, although slightly off to one side, and then he would ping the ship to make the torpedoes curve in slightly and start to home. Then he would launch a second set of torpedoes 
off to the other side of the ship and then he would ping the second point on the ship to make that second set of torpedoes start to curve in slightly towards the target. So what he was basically doing was setting up a cross drop. <laughs> now it wasn't a strict 90 degree cross drop, it was more like a 60 degree angle, but making it much, much more difficult or more likely that if the target, maybe it's running hydro, it detects the first set of torpedoes, it turns to avoid them because it's only two torpedoes. But that sets it up more or less perfectly to get hit by the second set of torpedoes right in the side. So that might be something that they might have to address because it could, I mean, you know, if it works once, people are going to want to do it every time. But this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. This is one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to getting involved in the whole testing process. And hopefully you guys are too. Equally, hopefully, I've given you something to talk about down below in the comments. So let me know what you think. What sort of potential problems have we perhaps not foreseen? How could it all go horribly, horribly wrong? And what's good about it? Let's, let's see what you think in the comments, because that's pretty much it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I am done. I need to put this episode to bed and shortly afterwards put myself to bed too. But as always, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it. Take care and I'll catch you next time.